CityCast from Explicity. A thousand and some years ago, there arose in southern India an empire that was among the most remarkable the world has seen. It grew atop the tottering scaffolding and shifting sands of fading dynasties and fierce rivalries, ruthless kings and double-crossing aspirants, myth-burnished, propelled forward by the slow burn of faith and the blazing fires of boundless ambition. It defied a myriad obstacles that came its way, and yet, through all the struggles and violence, it also cultivated and refined an aesthetic sensibility of breathtaking beauty. This was the Chola Empire. And in a dynasty that did not lack for larger-than-life characters, there was one in particular who stood head and shoulders above by the standards of any day. He was Raja Raja Chola, King Squared, King of Kings, a fitting name for this multifaceted man who built one of the world's most glorious empires for whom a single Raja would be pitifully inadequate, wholly unequal to the magnitude of what he accomplished. He made his mark on the vast and messy canvas of the convoluted socio-political dynamics of his time. No mean feat in an era teeming with ambitious and brutal rulers. He fortified the foundations of what was till then a ragtag kingdom, put into place a meticulously organized system of administration, and led the empire into a period of magnificent splendor and grandeur that reigned supreme in military might as an economic powerhouse and in art, architecture, literature, music, dance, and religion. Who was this man, this king of jewels, incomparable Chola, great savior, jewel of the Sola dynasty, lion among kings? He was born Arul Mori Varman in 947, the third child of Sundara Chola and Banuman Mahadevi. His older brother Aditya Karikalan, the crown prince, was killed in suspicious circumstances and so the younger son ended up being crowned emperor in the year 985. He was close to his older sister, Kundave, and had a great deal of respect for his great-aunt, Sembian Mahadevi. This alone must have set him apart from the typical male of his time. Rajaraja was clearly a remarkable man with an extraordinary outlook and vision, a Jupiter in a universe of small planets. Narcissistic, ambitious, power-hungry, ruthless, far-sighted, shrewd, compassionate, generous. He makes for a fascinating character study. There has been a lot of interest of late about the old Tamil kingdom, the Chola Empire. And that's for many reasons. The reason that looms the largest is the recent blockbuster movie Puni and Selvan, which is all about the most famous of all the Cholas, King Rajaraja. The movie has found itself politicized by a controversy about what labels to apply to Rajaraja's religion, but that's a subject for better minds than mine. The movie is based on a serialized account in a Tamil magazine, Kalki, written as historical fiction many years ago by this wonderful writer, Krishnamurti. He was called Kalki Krishnamurti because his identity was fused with that of the magazine. His articles ran for several years in the 1950s and then were published as a book that ran into several volumes and over 2,000 pages. Movies are one thing, but closer home, everyone that I know from the south of India has felt a need to learn more about the history of this region. In the national school curriculum, the history of the south was always reduced to a footnote. We were taught very little about our own history. It's hard to understand why. Of course, other than the desire to have North Indian politics dominate the national identity and necessarily marginalize the South. It's not that the history of the South was not as significant as the history of the Northern empires about which we were schooled in pitiless detail. For one thing, the Cholas were one of the longest-running empires in all of history. The earliest historic references to the Cholas dates back to 300 BC. 
And the empire was disestablished only in 1279 AD. That's just shy of 1,600 years. By comparison, the Mughal Empire ran from 1526 to, say, 1857. That's under 350 years. For another, while the Indian region was invaded and occupied variously for thousands of years, the Cholas were significant in their thalassocratic or maritime escapades into Southeast Asia, and their trade routes extended to Guangzhou in China and uh, the Silk Route on the other side. The Cholas ruled the Maldives and Sri Lanka, and clearly they knew where to sail to and whom to fight. There was no greater time in all of the Chola years than during the rule of Rajarajeshwaran that ran from 985 AD to about 1014 AD. Uh, that's about three decades. And if you made a list of all the stuff that he had achieved, from infrastructure and construction to military campaigns across the South and overseas, you would find it hard to figure out how someone could do so much in so little time in the present day leave alone over a thousand years ago. My guest today is Kamini Dandapani. She is a New York-based corporate executive, Chase Manhattan Bank and McKinsey Consulting being feathers in her plume. Kamini does not call herself a historian. As a hobbyist, though, she started writing a blog about historical places that she had visited in the south of India. There's a link to her blog in the podcast description. She says that Aleph the reputable publishing house, called and asked her if she would write a book. And she did. And this book is titled Rajaraja Chola, King of Kings. I chose Kamini Dandapani and this book to present on the podcast because it is a wonderfully structured book. The book is broken down into easily digestible chapters, and Kamini strikes no elegant postures in her recounting the rule of one of the most respected kings in all of world history. In the parlance of the present, we might refer to Rajaraja as woke, efficient, and progressive. Kamini's biography of him brings us closer to the history of the South in a way that cannot be replaced by comic books and movies. Kamini is a writer, a historian, a Carnatic singer, a Bharatanatyam dancer, and a trained Western classical pianist. And she joins me now from her home in Manhattan, Kamini Dandapani. Welcome to the Literary City. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. You know, as I have just been saying, I can't think of another situation where so little is known publicly about so famous a man. I mean, our school history sucked, didn't it? Exactly. I mean, this is something I quibble about all the time. Hmm. I mean, I'm the last person to say that one history is better or worse or superior, inferior, nothing like that. Right. But our history that we were taught was very North India centric. So we mm. had the Mauryas, the Guptas, the Mughals, and then the um, British and then the independence movement. I don't think we even heard about the Cholas or Pallavas or anything like that. So the, the, if if we did, there was one paragraph that was tucked in somewhere. Footnote. Was, footnote. <laughs> so, barring Kalki Krishnamurti, we only have the comic book versions of uh, Raja Raja. Exactly, exactly. It's something of a travesty that South Indians don't know yes. South Indian history. Yes, right. You're absolutely right. And the little bit that we do know is a kind of a Disneyland version. There are kind of movies that that are so far out that you can you can just laugh. You know, just have have a good laugh. But now that you've written this uh, properly researched book. Uh, people must be coming up to you all the time and thanking you for doing it. You must hear this all the time, right? Yes, that's definitely a common thread. Everybody, most people, just like what you said just now, mm. they hated history growing up in school because of the way it was taught. It's right, just right. regurgitating dates and names without any interesting facts right, there. Right. But I also think that in all of us, at some point in life, a, a switch gets turned on where we suddenly start becoming curious about our history. Yes. And then in my case, it was reading books like by somebody like William Dalrymple that really opened my eyes to how, and he was my, when I read The City of Jinns, I was like, wow, you know, I, I lived in Delhi for a few years and I, I wish I had read it then when I was there in Delhi. And uh, that a history could be, you know, presented in this fashion was kind of eye-opening to me. So in some ways he was my inspiration. He is my inspiration. 
And uh, the other thing is, you know, I kind of, I, my kids are growing up here, not that they're interested, but I thought I'd start a blog and write about South India. Just it covers a wide range of things. I mean, South India. I've, I've read it. I've read your blog. Okay. So that's just to kind of tell them what South India is about, you know, without being pedantic and just giving them different kinds of stories about it. And um, it was a kind of a fairy tale thing, I guess, because the publisher, Aleph, somebody, I guess, saw it and they approached me and asked me if I would write this book. And I said, me, I'm not a historian. Uh, yeah. And they said, that's precisely why we're asking you, because we don't want a scholarly, um, you know, dense uh, academic kind of a book. We right, want something right. that can be read by the, the lay person. So that, that's how that, that happened. And, Wonderful. Yeah, so, well, yeah, but there are some wonderful writers out there today also writing these kind of histories. So yeah. I'm, I'm hopeful. Getting to your subject, Raja Raja, he ruled from 985 to 1014 AD. Let's get some perspective here. Now, in the fullness of the history that we know, how long is that? Let's throw a dart at it. Okay. Call it 6,000 years. Yes. 985 is... Yes. More than the halfway mm -hmm. mark, it's closer mm -hmm. to us than them. That's definitely one way of looking at it. Yes. So, put into perspective, okay. 985 AD seems like so long ago for uh, a man like Rajaraja to be taking the strategic decisions yeah. that he did. Mm -hmm. But think about it, so much had already happened in history by then, hadn't it? Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, let's see. Uh, Jainism and Buddhism were already about 1,100 years old. The uh, Achaemenid Empire was 1,000 years old. Christianity, St. Thomas, in the same area, was already had arrived 900 years before Rajaraja. Islam was more than 300 years before him. And let's not forget that his own empire, the Chola Empire, was over 1,000 years old at that point. Exactly. Right. Yes, yes. So he must have lived among Christians, among Muslims, and in a well-developed society. So tell me, as a Raja Raja scholar, what sense of history do you think he had? Well, you just said it just now. I think he definitely brought all those centuries of history um, into how he thought and uh, how he ruled. I think Raja Raja was a man who had a very uh, deep sense of history. And you can see that in a lot of his actions. He, and the world, we think of, you know, what we call it, like globalization as something new. I don't think so at all. It has been going on ever since, you know, for, for, for millennia. I agree. Point. So even the earlier Cholas, Chol, Sangam Cholas, who lived 2,000 years ago, had people from, you know, Greece and Rome come and trade with them. There have been coins from those times found there. There have been accounts of people traveling back and forth. So, yes, we didn't have Google then, but there were <laughs> other means of communication, you know. So uh, I think there was a lot of communication going back and forth. There were a lot of people traveling up and down to different parts, to China, to Southeast Asia, to, to Egypt, to the Fatimid dynasty, to those parts of the world. And I think Rajaraja was definitely had his ear to the ground, figuring out what was going on. You know, for instance, he sent an expedition to China, a trade mission to China. How did he know that this was the place to go to? You know, so he was aware that he had people come and report to him that this place is giving offering trade benefits and it would be good to kind of set up a good trading partnership. He was aware that the Sri Vijaya kingdom to his east was vying for the same piece of the pie. And he was aware that he needed to do something to kind of... Uh, overtake them and, and get to the Chinese. Similarly, a horse trader is who told him that there was anarchy and chaos in Sri Lanka and he launched his attack over there. And the Cholas themselves had a sense of history going back way into the past. So what evidence is there of any structured education in the day? Frankly, we just have like snippets that um, <clears throat> they have these Brahmin villages in which the, um, the children there were taught the Vedas and the scriptures and I don't know who read and uh, wrote because I talked about the inscriptions on the walls. I doubt that the general public were able to read that, but there were certainly scribes who, have, who would have read them aloud to people. So what the level of literacy was, I don't know, but I'm guessing it's low. It was just a certain segment of society who could read and write. But education also covered the martial arts, for instance. They said um, Raja Raja had his son Rajendra well-educated 
across a multitude of fields that included you know horseback riding elephant fighting archery so those were considered important in an era when you know that's how you built your empire but then they also said he learned the scriptures and uh, and and that kind of thing so um what else they studied i honestly i i don't know so how do they write they uh, we know about the virakala the hero stones the temple inscriptions but uh, it couldn't have all been yes. stone right? but they were also on palm leaf for manuscripts okay so i think the uh, whatever for instance if you gave uh, an order or a grant it was first inscribed on palm leaf documents and then they were subsequently transferred to stone but the palm leaves survived yeah. didn't they i mean everything we know from the sangam period came yeah. from mm-hmm. palm leaves mm-hmm. yeah it's kind of mind boggling if you think about it so they must have had some technology to preserve these palm uh, palm leaves but then they were eventually discovered only in the you know 19th and 20th century rotting away in attics and you know right. other places right but not rotting enough right I mean, a leaf yeah. falls in your garden, and a few hours later, it's gone. Totally, yeah. So I guess it was processed in some way to make it last longer. It is. If you go to the Saraswati Mahal Library in Tanjavur, they have some of those. Um, Never been there. It is. It is a remarkable collection. Right. And, But uh, let's not also forget that these are the guys that made steel in 600 BC, exported it to the Middle East, from where the famous Damascus swords were made. Right. Exactly. Yes. Now back to Raja Raja. Yes. You say that when he was born there was great fanfare and when trumpets were sounded and so on and people spoke of the birth of a new king. They foretold this. I mean, right? Were they just in a mood? I think they were in a mood to say so <laughs> because remember I said Cholas were masters at PR at public relations and kind <laughs> of yeah they I think they mastered the art of social media and image projection. Way ahead before any of these became uh, buzzwords. That's cool. So the truth is that it was Raja Raja's brother who was earmarked, who was supposed to become the king. So, so why would there be all this fair fanfare when Raja Raja was born? You know, but they had to say all that that he was born. He had the mark of Vishnu on his, uh, you know, on his arms, and and you know all these bells rang and things like that. So it was all just to create this buzz that this great man is here on earth and. so much of history is like retrofitted you kind of create all this image after the fact so it. fake news is and not new are, huh this is not new at all sir there are gullible people always raja raja the great now great is yes. normally accorded to kings who win great battles and they, it's military prowess and success normally now you wrote that for the first several years of his reign one didn't see too many hero stones extolling his exploits you said that he was a good administrator and wanted yes. to get things right that would be remarkable it is and i think it speaks to a certain maturity to raja raja i mentioned this early on early on in his chapter that he had a long apprenticeship first under his father and then his uncle where he he saw the ups and downs that the kingdoms went through and what what it took to kind of push the kingdom forward so i think he focused on you know getting the house in order attacking those kingdoms that needed to be attacked primarily the pandyas to the south the cheras to the west and i guess he didn't blow his trumpet until he felt it was time to do that now isn't that and, the uh, hallmark of an educated man it is of a mature educated man i i, I do think so and i think rajaraja was a mature person he was his thinking was not let's just kind of blindly you know uh, go in there and attack but let's do it methodically and let's let's bide our time you know so you speak highly of his uh, administrative skills in fact you spend a lot of time outlining those uh, those practices that was a difficult chapter to write because it's like it's tedious and it's all all the evidence is from his inscriptions you know so again when i said earlier that raja raja had a keen sense of history i really believe that he recorded everything that he did so when he commissioned his land survey that was recorded you know and he named the person who did it and um everything was inscribed on on temple walls because i think if there was a dispute or if there was any kind of questioning you go to that wall and say here here it is you know um it's it, it's proven and and he 
standardized everything. So as I said earlier, he inherited a kingdom that was very kind of um, diverse, uh, to, to put it uh, mildly. You know, the people from uh, the hills, the people from the, the river delta, there were the, the multiple castes of people, and they were all kind of brought together. So he had to kind of come up with a standardized uh, uh, way of running the whole thing. So everything, all the sources of information are inscriptions. And there are some amazing historians who have, you know, analyzed all the inscriptions, come up with the uh, kind of data based on inscription analysis to get information on land ownership, who lo- who owned the land, how these villages were organized. You have inscriptions about uh, village committees and how you got elected to the committee. And the level of detail is mind boggling. It's really mind boggling. And um, you know, by a tip of my hat to the historians who went through this stuff. It's uh, Chola inscriptions are, I think, the most numerous of all inscriptions. I mean, they, they inscribed everything on their walls. As a young Tamil boy, I got into trouble for scribbling on my walls. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to do it. So, You know, another thing that they say is that uh, India didn't conduct military campaigns outside India. But that's not true of Rajaraja, was it? Now, yes. I mean, he went everywhere, didn't he? He did go everywhere, but he did not, nor did his son actually colonize them, meaning he was not their lo- ruler or king. And again, the acid test is the inscriptions. His, his inscriptions were not there. But I think what he did was have, have them under a tight leash and say, you better listen to me. Uh-huh. And you do as I, as I say. And I think uh, there were Chola women married to, you know, princelings and kings and things from from, uh, from those parts. The only place he actually, they actually colonized was Sri Lanka, that is outside the mainland of India. And that was, that proved very, very difficult. You know, that was constantly, they did not like being under Cho, under the Chola thumb and there were constantly, you know, rebellions breaking out. And so it was for a short while, actually, that Sri Lanka remained a Chola territory. And um, they wanted it because it was um, rich in copper. In fact, there's a theory that a lot of the copper that came to make the uh, Chola bronzes came came from uh, from Sri Lanka. They were part of the trade route that went further east. And uh, I think the pearl fisheries uh, were also uh, valuable to the Cholas because they used the pearls uh, for the jewels, for their idols and things like that. But they did not colonize, contrary to what is believed, they did not actually colonize Southeast Asia except perhaps culturally. So if you go there, you know, the, the religion and uh, the, the, the Hindu parts there that probably came from the Pallavas. Well, we can't blame him for the Thai people mixing up our epics now, can we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> he also annexed the Maldives, didn't he? Yes, Maldives, yes. He went, he attacked what they think are the Maldives in, in uh, off the west coast of India. They call it the 12,000 old islands of the sea or something like that. So again, those islands were also part of the trading route that, you know, came from Egypt and the Persian Gulf. Um, when he, he, one of his first military expeditions was against Kerala, actually, the Chera Kingdom. R- and right. I, think, I mean, he got into a snit with that guy and yeah, went there and chopped off his head. These guys took offense when I, God knows what. So it's, it's kind of funny, actually. So, uh, but I think the Chera, the Kerala people probably controlled those trade ports. So this was one way of getting getting a hold of that. Your book is very interesting and it clearly explains why you picked Rajaraja as your subject. A question. Mm-hmm. Many of your chapter titles are, have uh, sun and moon motives. Yes. Uh, I did that deliberately because uh, they're part of the solar dynasty. Mm-hmm. So that kind of, I, I decided to use that whenever I, I could. Actually. Very nice so, theme. So- did you pick those chapter titles yourself? Yeah, I did all the titles myself. <laughs> yes, so so the book cover also they kind of played on that, and they had that big shiny sun on the cover. But nice yeah, it touch. was uh, I kind of thought. You know the way you describe the politics that Rajaraja had to endure, different people in the Kaveri base and other people squabbling, different factions. You could be describing modern Tamil Nadu politics. Totally, Ramji, because. You know, you read and then you realize everything moves in a cycle. You think it's linear. It is not. It's like Everything is going to go one way and then come back. So, put in that, I guess Okay, that. let's talk about the movie now. I really don't want to, but it is the elephant in the room. It is the elephant in the room, yes. 
So what do you want me to talk about, the movie or the controversy? First, when did you start writing this book? I'd say about four or five years back, but I had a kind of a health thing in the middle, so that had to take a back seat. But yeah, it's been about four or five years. So well, before the movie... Complete coincidence? It is totally coincidental, and I'm hoping to write on the coattails of the uh, of the movie. Why not, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> As anyway. indeed you should. It's a wonderful book, and for our listeners... There's a link in the podcast description to where you can buy a copy of Raja Raja Chola, King of Kings by Kamini Dandapani. And now for some trivial questions. You said that uh, he was the son of Vanavan Mahadevi and Sundara Chola. The son of Vanavan Mahadevi, yes. And mm-hmm. his wife was also Vanavan Mahadevi. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes, so these were not names, actually titles. So uh, what kind of model? Too many Vanavan Mahadevis. Common name? <laughs> Probably that too, but I don't think those were their birth names. Ah. So I think it, it kind of implied where they came from or um, you know what clan they belonged to, something like that, because I read somewhere that I think it is Panchavan meant a Pallava, uh, sorry, a Pandya connection. So this is something I didn't probe too deeply into, but they, they were all monikers given to the queen. And so they all have, there's a handful of names and it's very confusing because... Uh, oh, that and, uh, certainly were... clears it up. <laughs> yes. You know, you end so, your book with a number of adjectives, sublime, luminous. Did you feel that way or did you just <laughs> fall in love with your subject? I never fell in love with him, but I did. You know, you step back and you say, wow, you know, here we are over a thousand years later talking about him. That must mean something, right? He, right. He was in this little corner of India and uh, he kind of made a mark uh, and he pushed uh, his boundaries beyond anything that had been done that far. He did everything on a, on a massive, on a grand scale. So uh, I I don't think he would be the ideal dinner party companion. No, I would not like to sit <laughs> there because he'd probably dominate everything and maybe behead a person or two. But definitely there is admiration. I admire the man, certainly. So. I may not like him, but I, I certainly, certainly admire him. And I, I, I meant all those glowing words. So. Yes, that's very clear. And proof of that is what you named your dog. <laughs> well, the dog came, he came earlier. He's just Roger. He was first named after Roger Federer. I see. But then I called him Roger, Roger Chola and I said, why not? So, so. <laughs> Well, game set and match to Roger, Roger Cholan over Roger Federer. Well, on that wonderful note, Kamini Dandapani, thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. Thank you. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for having me here. My pleasure entirely. And that was Kamini Dandapani, author of Raja Raja Chola, King of Kings. And I'll be back with What's That Word? That fun segment where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time, but never stop to think about. In a minute, or less than a minute, depending on where you are. And I'm back. This is What's That Word? And this is my co-host. Hello. My name is Pranati. But you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. And hello to you, P in the uh, P with Mm. an A. (laughs) Hey, how is your Chola sentiment all stoked? And how? You know, I had no interest in watching this uh, Pony and Sylvan movie. Mm -hmm. But that interview with Kamini Dandapani, it has me very interested, you know. That was a lovely conversation. Thank you. It was very enjoyable. Yeah. And in your monologue, you talked about the different attempts to fictionalize the story of Raja Raja. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember uh, something about a previous movie, and I think it was also called Pony and Selvan. Yes, that's right. It never got made. You know, there have been many attempts. Now, for one thing, MGR, for our overseas listeners, M.G. Ramachandran was one of the biggest movie stars, and then he was the chief minister of Tamil Nadu state for many years. MGR tried making the movie in the late 1950s, but apparently he had problems getting financing, and it was shelved. Then in the early 1990s, Kamala Hassan, another huge movie star, tried turning it into a TV series, but that idea too got nowhere. Many years, many attempts later, here it is. Right. But 
Is it a fictionalized history? I mean, there has been some criticism. Why not? My view is that movies are there not to educate. They exist to entertain, <laughs> right? I mean, people ought to pursue history <laughs> by themselves and not expect movie makers to become history professors. <laughs> right. I dare say they would do a better job than our high school history teachers. <laughs> I submit. But I believe those things are called documentaries. <laughs> Right, of course. And there are some wonderful history books available on Raja Raja. I dipped into quite a few prepping for this interview. Gripping pot boilers. <laughs> Another thing you said was that the writer was referred to as Kalki Krishnamurti. <laughs> so his identity became his name. I mean, how do people get these monikers? <laughs> it's a Tamil thing, okay? I'm sure that it's used in many cultures. But I'm familiar with uh, this whole, always this business of someone's employer's name being used to identify that someone. <laughs> wow, how convenient. Maybe, but there have been some hilarious results. Really? Do tell. I love hilarity. <laughs> so there was this guy in my neighborhood when I lived in Delhi. His name was either Samba Murti or Samba Shivam or something like that. Anyway, of course, he was called Sam for short, right? Of course. And he worked for the airline Pan Am. So the name on his gate post read Pan Am Sam. <laughs> That's clever. <laughs> well, that one's sort of cool. Spare a thought for this guy, my parents' friend, Rajaratnam, who worked for a leatherette making company called Bohr. Spelt B H O R. Oh no. And they called him Bor Rajaratnam. <laughs> that is the funny yes. And it didn't help that he was not a sparkling wit and dazzling conversationalist. <laughs> you know, tell him I'm not home was a lie that I was taught early in life. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. How did he live it down? Well, people were cooler back then. He would call and introduce himself and he would say, this is Bohr Rajaratnam speaking. <laughs> Sweet. Well, he was a sport. Like turtle racing? <laughs> okay, stop. I don't want to know any more of this absurd Tamil humor. I've had enough. <laughs> okay, P with an A. What's that word? So... Usually, we pick familiar words and phrases, mm -hmm. but I have been dying to ask you this one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you mentioned chola steel in your interview. Yes, what about it? Well, I had read a phrase in reference to the Damascus sword. Ah. I, I, I read it somewhere years ago, but mm -hmm. filed it away in my mind. Okay. So this guy grips his Damascus sword and threatens, I will give you an Indian answer. <laughs> yes, I know that one. You know, no one should experience that. But what does it mean? And am I right to suspect it has something to do with that steel? It totally does. So he grips his Damascus sword and he says, I'll give you an Indian answer. Let me explain. So first the meaning. You know, starting from 600 BC, there was manufacture and export of steel from the Chola Empire, presumably through the traders from the Cheras in the West, this steel is called Woots steel, which is probably a corruption of the Tamil word Uruku or Uku in Kannada, for instance. And it was unknown to civilizations outside India, the making of the steel, I mean. But the toughness of that metal was used to make that distinctively shaped Damascus sword. It's curved. It's like a scimitar, but, but thinner and hard. That's what she said. <laughs> Ooh, good one. <laughs> anyway, therefore, it could be sharpened when needed, like unlike other metals, and it would just cut through all other weapons. Wow, must have been a great weapon. So, are there accounts of it in battle? Tons of accounts of the Damascus sword in battle. It was used widely and well. But there is this one fascinating story of uh, Alexander, you know, the great, that one, he was returning to Greece and he was gifted a hundred talents of steel pellets, or was it ingots, by King Porus of Sindh. What's a talent? The same weight as a tola. And what's a tola? 180 troy grains. <laughs> okay, I'll play. 
What's 180 grains in real numbers? Three-eighths of a troy ounce. <laughs> okay, fine. You win. <laughs> All right. It's just shy of 12 grams. <laughs> there. Now I can breathe again. Okay. So tell me about the unkindest cut of all, please. Unkindest cut of all. Hey, you know, that's a phrase for a future. What's that word? Good. <laughs> all right. Right. So with this tale, the Arabs and the Persians made the famous Damascus swords, which then with which they silenced their enemies. So when the Arabs cut off someone's head with that sword, they called it the Juab al-Hind, or the Indian answer. <laughs> nice to be renowned for decapitation. <laughs> that renowned. Yeah, the, but the sword was much respected. Yeah. Where else do the references occur? Well, you see, the fame of the Woots steel was such that it was coveted in all of Europe and the Middle East because the world had seen nothing like it before. There's even a King Arthur reference. Oh, wow. Do tell. So, in this book by Sir Walter Scott, The Talisman. The Talisman is a, you know, it's a work of fiction. It's based on the, the uh, Third Crusade that took place towards the end of the uh, 12th century. And I, I think about 1185, 1187, AD, thereabouts. Anyway, the story contains a narration of, uh, of this encounter that happened between King Richard the Lionhearted and Sultan Salahuddin, you know, commonly known as Saladin. So <laughs> mm -hmm. that name always made me laugh, Saladin. You know, it's, mm. it's neither <laughs> Salad nor Aladdin. Anyway, so so Richard the Lionheart breaks a steel bar into two with a single slash from his sword Oblivion. And in response, Saladin slashes a wisp of silk using his Damascus sword. Now, astounded by this, Richard said that even the famed sword Excalibur of King Arthur could not cut through something like silk. Now, you think, why was that? See, silk offers no resistance. So think about being able to slice through something in the air that's like silk. It's, the steel was that sharp, and that could only be done right. by something as tensile as, as steel. So what happened? Where's the steel now? It's been lost to history. Long story, the iron that was used to, uh, to make this wood steel was being mined in a forest near the in, in the south of india but the forest is not protected has long been protected and uh, the source is all dried out so no more mining there anyway I, let me tell you that there's this uh, there's this wonderful account of uh, the steel by uh, two professors from bangalore you can google it it's, it's all over the internet as to what was the chemical composition of the steel the metallurgy of it all so to speak but it's all available out there cool now my last question mm -hmm. why is it called the damascus sword how does syria come into it mm, that's a tad murky the popular version is that the city of damascus has little to do with it or maybe it did we don't know but what is more commonly accepted is that it was called Damascus because the surface of the steel had wavy patterns on it. And uh, the Arabs called it Damas. Now, in Arabic, the word ma is water. So start deriving from there, yeah. right? So Damas means watery, but the more likely meaning of the word is wavy or even shimmery. Ah, like that jewelry company in Dubai, uh, Damas. You know, I didn't think of that. You're right. Principally known for gold, probably because of its shimmery nature. Yeah, good. Yeah, probably. Hmm. Yeah, this is all very interesting. You know, everything is so connected. Except the head of the guy who was given the Indian answer. <laughs> okay, I will now think of things that don't give me nightmares. Bye. <laughs> And that is our show. I would like to thank my guest, Kamini Dandapani, my co-host, Pranithi P with an A, Martha, and you for being here and for listening. Now, before you go, hit that subscribe button. Never miss an episode of The Literary City. Have a great week and see you again next Wednesday. Oh, 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 oh